Welcome to Bring the Lord Salsa Star. Joining us from Dallas, Texas, Stuart Minton, producer of the film Voiceless. Jonathan Suber, senior pastor of Oasis Church in Round Rock, Texas. Jessica Marquez, lead pastor of Mega Vida Miami downtown in Miami, Florida, and director and founder of Women Ministry to Women International. Jessica Suarez, worship singer and songwriter. With music guest, Eddie Martinez. And now your host, Reverend Tony Suarez, Executive Vice President of the National Hispanic Christian Leadership Conference. Well, I don't think we say it enough, so I'm going to say it one more time. Let everything that hath breath praise ye the Lord. All over Dallas, would you make noise for Jesus tonight? Amen. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Welcome to TBN Salsa, and I hope you're ready for camp meeting. I hope you're ready for revival. I hope you're ready for what God is going to do. This is an anointed, act, an active night where God is going to speak a word that I believe is going to change your life. So wherever you're watching, from the hospital room to the prison cell, to your home, the kitchen, maybe you're watching us on your, on your mobile app in your, in your car, and you're not driving, I hope in Jesus' name. But wherever you are, I just, I just believe that God has a word for you. The Bible says in the book of John chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and that's nice, but in Spanish it says, en el principio era el verbo, y el verbo era con Dios, y el verbo era Dios. Not only is it more romantic in Spanish, it's more powerful in Spanish, because in Spanish it does not say, li listen to this, in Spanish it does not say, in the beginning was the Word, it says, in the beginning was the verb, because the God that I serve, He doesn't just speak words. He speaks verbs. Verbs are words that are active. They are creative. Every word that has ever come out of the mouth of God is a word that is alive. And I'm declaring that as this program goes forward, the verb of God is being released into your home, into your marriage, into your money, into your family, into your relationships. And I'm believing that that word, that, wor that verb that is released is going to change your life. And by the time this program is over, you're going to call TBN and you're going to say, my life has changed right now because the verb has come into my house. Would you give God praise wherever you are right now? You're going to hear from Jessica Marquez, from Stuart Migdon. You're going to hear from Jonathan Suber. We're going to have an amazing program, but right now we're going to go right into the worship with Eddie Martinez, one of my favorite worship leaders all the way from Houston. Would you make noise and welcome Eddie Martinez. Yeah. 
igual purifica me con fuego has borrado mi maldad ah, yo quiero más de ti más de tu presencia tu existencia más de tu amor yo quiero más de ti más de tu presencia tu existencia más de tu amor yo quiero más de ti más de tu presencia tu existencia más de tu amor yo Tu amor, más de tu amor en mí. Oh, yeah. Oh. Amen. 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 Eddie, Eddie Martinez is uh, someone I've known for several years, and uh, after completing his undergraduate degree at Christian Life College, he served as a worship pastor at Epicenter Church in Long Beach, California. Later on, he led worship in the Spanish service at one of America's largest churches, Second Baptist Church, pastored by Dr. Ed Young, and uh, he recorded with Jackie Velasquez. He is, uh, he's an amazing worship leader, so he'll be blessing us the entire program, and I, I trust he'll be a blessing for you as well. I am very honored to have my next guest with me today. This is Stuart Migdon from, uh, from Jersey. You know, two East Coast guys over here, down here in the South in Texas. Right. That's it. I, uh, we don't know what to do. We're looking for like <laughs> pizza and hot dogs and they keep giving us brisket with bags of bread. What is this I, food I don't, all about? <laughs> I, don't under, I don't understand the bread thing here. Like they'll just give you like rolls of bread with, you, it's, I, I don't, I gotta talk to somebody about it. But anyhow, uh, Stuart, after graduating with a business degree from Gow, Dowling College in 1980, practiced public accounting for five years, following which he entered into the insurance field, manages his own employee benefit broker company. And in 1991, he put his faith in Jesus Christ and his life completely changed. And God became the most important thing in his life. He is an elder at his church, a Christian author. And now he is, and this is why uh, we have Stuart here tonight. He is now the producer of the soon-to-be-released film that is going to be uh, available in uh, theaters all across America uh, called Voiceless. Stuart, welcome to the program. Glad it to is great you. to be here. Thank you, brother. So... I was I was raised I was raised in church, and so sometimes in the church we had people that try to read you and try to figure you out, but they they wouldn't start in Genesis. They'd like start somewhere like in Thessalonians of your life, like you know, like closer to the end, and they try to start there. But every good story, if you're going to understand it, you have to go to the beginning. So the Genesis of Stuart and what led you to where you are today. Let's start there and tell me how you find Jesus, how you come to the gospel, and what impact that had on your life. Yeah, you know, I would say the first dramatic life moment for me was when I was 18 years old, my high school girlfriend called me up and told me she was pregnant. Well? Three weeks later, we were married. Five months later, I was a dad at the age of 18, mm. and I thought that I was carrying the whole weight of the world on my shoulders. It was a very difficult time for me. We were poor, things were difficult, and I struggled, went to college, graduated in four years, worked 60 hours a week while I was in college, and it was all about money for me. Wait a second. So you, you have a baby and you're married at when 18. you're 18. 18. And you still went to college. Went to college full time. And you graduated. Graduated in four years, worked 60 hours a week. My life was about studying, working, sleeping, eating. That was it. I had nothing else to do. People were having fun, throwing frisbees around at the college. Uh, and I was home studying or working, and that was my life. I honor you. I honor you because I, 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 even though we don't really know each other, it would seem like you have a lot of excuses, or you would have had a lot of excuses to not get married, to not raise that child, to not go to school. You'd have a lot of excuses to still be poor, to still be struggling, but you didn't let these challenges that came about stop you from being able to, to go forward and to progress in your life. Yeah. There's somebody watching that's at that same moment. Maybe they're not 18. Maybe they're at a different stage of life. But what, what was it? What, help me understand that. What, 
what inside of you compelled you? What, what was that push inside of you that said, I have to graduate. I, I, I cannot stay in poverty. I have to go forward. Yeah, you know, I, I think it, it can be typified after about a month of marriage, my wife and I had this discussion and, and she said to me, honey, if you graduate in five years, it won't be the end of the world. Take five years. And I said, no, I've got to do it in four years. And she came home with a plaque for me, a gift. And I said, why are you buying me a gift? We have no money. She said, don't worry. It was only a couple of dollars. And it was called the Don't Quit plaque. Mm. I memorized it. Uh, in five minutes, hung it on my bedroom wall, and 40 years later, it's still hanging on my bedroom wall, and it goes like this. Don't quit. Success is failure turned inside out. The silver tint of the clouds of doubt. And you never can tell how close you are. It may be nearer when it seems afar. So stick to the fight when your heart is hit. It's when things seem worse that you mustn't quit. And that's what inspired me. Brother. You stuck it out four years with a wife and a baby, and you stuck it out. And, you're, you're, and I'll tell you why I'm laughing here. You, your wife said, what's five years? So that leads me to my next point. You weren't raised Pentecostal then, were you? No. Because, like, for us Pentecostals, five years, like, we were like, you know, the rapture could happen in any moment. <laughs> we couldn't wait five years. We couldn't even, like, we couldn't wait to get married. We're like, the rapture could come tomorrow, and I've been holy for 18 years in Jesus' name. Just give me one more day, Jesus. And then five years for college. My, but so you must be Baptist or something because you're waiting it out and just... Lord, that, that's amazing. So, and I'm not making light of your story, but most people would say, I don't have time to wait five years. I don't have time to wait three years yeah. because we're so impatient. Yeah. Patience is, I'm, I'm still learning. I'm, I'm, and I'm not, I'm, I'm nowhere uh, nearly, I'm not gifted with patience at all. It is, it is my struggle to be, when they say wait, my next question is how long? Yeah. You know, how long? And it, this, but you, you waited, you stuck it out and God blessed you. And, and at some point after this, you come to find Jesus Christ. Yeah, you know, I am a Jewish. Mm. And so I was raised in a Jewish home. I, was, uh, I went well, to Hebrew school. Well, then I school. take back all this. I'm I so know. Sorry. We got all this Pentecostal shalom. stuff going on. Yeah, shalom so Aleichem. Yeah, Shalom Aleichem to you, brother. Yeah. I'm so sorry. God bless Jerusalem tonight <laughs> as, as well. And, <laughs> amen. All right, so you're raised Jewish. So I'm raised Jewish. Uh, you know, synagogue, bar mitzvah at 13, confirmed in my reform synagogue wow. at 15. Uh, and you know what? Uh, I was just so focused on succeeding financially that that's all I thought about. And finally, at the age of 30, though, I sat in my office one day, and I was starting to make it. And I, I, I started to say to myself, well, what happens if I make X plus Y or Y plus Z and it started to feel empty for me? Mm. And so that led me on my search. And three years later, uh, after meeting several people and, and getting challenges to read the Bible but hearing nothing about Jesus, a man said to me, who I was meeting for a business appointment, Stuart, could you ever believe that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah? And Tony, I can remember what I said, and it was 25 years ago, but I can remember it as if it were yesterday. I said, Sal, it would be easier for me to believe that I'm a female than to believe that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. Wow. And he said to me, that's the craziest response I ever heard. Can I pray for you? <laughs> I said, no. No man's ever prayed for me before, and you're not going to be the first. But this dear man, Sal, prayed, and he, I don't remember what he said, but at the end, he said, Lord, I pray that you would remove the veil from Stuart's eyes and let him see that Yeshua is the Messiah. And then he invited me to his ordination as a, um, uh, as a minister. I went to that ordination. I don't know how I, I decided to go because I'd never been to a born-again Christian church in my life. I'd never heard about Jesus Christ, the gospel before, because everyone was afraid to tell me because I'm Jewish. And I walked into it, a, a wildly charismatic Pentecostal church, which I didn't even know what that meant. And people were dancing and singing in the aisles. And, I, and Sal was up front doing the same. And I had one hand on the door to leave and one hand on the door to stay. I sat down, heard the gospel message for the first time in my life, having read the Old Testament for three years. And then I just knew it was right. I knew Jesus Christ was Lord. I prayed right there in my seat, and my life changed dramatically. Somebody give God praise on that. <laughs> praise God. Praise God. What an incredible story. What an incredible story. And, and now God has anointed you to produce Christian films. Your first one yeah. is coming out in just a matter of weeks, and I want to encourage everybody that's watching tonight to look up Voiceless. Uh, the, the website is voicelessthemovie.com. It's showing all around the country. And I want to I urge you, compel you in Jesus' name, in the name of Jesus, compel you tonight to support 
Christian businesses and to support Christian movies and to get out and don't go alone. This is the this is the night to not go to the movies alone. This is the night to bring your friends, bring others with you. Pack those theaters out because they need to sh they need to see that Christians want more Christian films and that what not Amen. and not only do we want more but when one of our brothers puts their life savings or puts their name and their 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 fortune on the line and says I'm going I'm going to do a Christian film we need to be we need to be uh, enough of a blessing to say I'm going to go support it now, I'm going to buy movie tickets and I'm going to go and I'll, I'll even give some away, but I'm going to show that I, I respect and I bless the, the investment that my brother has made. And I, I honor you for what you've done and the story that you're doing. The, it's, it's, you're, you're not doing an, a, just a, another stereotypical Christian movie. Or something. You are tackling one of the most important issues of our time and it is the issue of life. And because it's your vision and it's your conviction, I want, I'm just going to allow you to talk about it. How is the movie birthed, and what's the message of the movie? And then here in a few minutes, we're going to see a clip from the movie. Okay, well, thank you, brother. So about five years ago, my partner and I got together, and we said we wanted to impact the culture for Jesus Christ. We kept coming back to the art of film. People go to the movie theater, mm -hmm. and they emulate the characters they see on the big screen. And unfortunately and sadly, uh, the, the, the screening room in a movie theater has more impact on even Christians than the pulpit does sometimes. Mm. And so we said, you know, there's so many godless movies produced out of Hollywood and so many movies that degrade the name of our Lord yeah. that we said, even though it's uncomfortable and scary, we're going to go ahead and put it in God's hands and make a movie that will bring glory to God. Amen. So when we were talking about what we would make it on, we wanted to make a movie that would inspire Christians to engage the culture. And that's where we stopped. We want to inspire Christians to engage the culture for Jesus Christ. When we thought about the topic, though, we kept coming back to what we believe is the most egregious sin of our lifetime and of all lifetime, and that's the sin of abortion. Yeah. So we made a movie that is written to the church, for the church, to motivate the church to stand up against the sin of abortion. Mm. But I'll tell you this, you know, we've won some film festival awards in secular film festivals, believe it or not. Praise God. And, and we have had pro-choice people see our movie and they were not offended by it because we didn't vilify the pro-choice movement. We instead encourage and inspire the pro-life movement to do something about this. That, you know, that, that's powerful. And, and I want us to get ready to roll this clip in in just a moment. I have, uh, I have been an outspoken uh, supporter, advocate for immigration reform for years. And I believe... Our immigration system has to be reformed. It's something I've been uh, met, you know, from the White House to the Capitol to the Senate. And, but this issue of life is more important than any other is legislative issue that we have a preference about. And there's a prophetic word that has been given to us. And, and, I, and, and I'm speaking to everyone watching tonight. Before you ever called yourself a Republican or a Democrat, you were called to be a Christian. And you must stand for your moral values, the things that matter to God. And there's a prophetic word that was given to us that if we would stand for the cause of life and religious liberty... God would give us immigration reform, but I, I and and we won't get we won't get political here tonight. But I, I'm, uh, Stuart, I'm to the point I can't vote for someone. I, I just can't support someone that would not make life a priority. It, it life is so. My daughter was born a preemie. She was eight months old when she was first born. And to hear certain people act as if, well, that's just that's just a choice whether you kept her or not. No, that was that was a life. She's nine years old today, completely healed, completely alive. And, and, and we have to get back to honoring the Imago Dei, the image of Christ in every single person. So I want to encourage those of you that are watching, those here in the studio audience, watch this clip from Voiceless. I believe it's going to bless you. Let's give a warm welcome to our new community outreach leader, Jesse D. It says here that uh, you work in the church now. So an army ranger who's now running an outreach at a church in the city. I'm thinking of starting some boxing training. Boxing at a church. Step forward. Step aside. You grab the wrist. Uh, uh, okay. I'm referring to the clinic that's across the street. It's a family planning clinic, right? And they also have about 5 to 20 abortions a day. And what are we doing? I'll tell you what we're doing, nothing. Is someone addressing the situation? I just told you I'm working on it. Will I see my baby in heaven? You don't have to do this. The church has changed, Jesse. 
We've become more like a lamp tucked under a basket rather than a light on top of a hill. You know what something like this could do to a church? Protesting reporters, now a death across the street. There's been death across the street for the past six months. Never question where God is leading you, even if sometimes it's a bit uncomfortable. This is what God would want you to know. Are you sure it's God leading you or just guilt? It's all penance, my friend. When you have a chance to save someone's life and they die, don't you always feel like you could have done more to help? Keep doing your boxing, Mr. Dean. At least you're swinging at something. This is what you were talking about, right? Take action. Isn't it our responsibility to protect these children, regardless of the consequences? This is about being a voice for the voiceless. That is The Voiceless coming to theaters in October. It is going to, it, it, I, believe it's, I believe it's going to bless people. I want to ask you about this, 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 this passion that you have about the church engaging culture. Some would say, well, we need to keep the church and politics separate. But this is, it's not about politics. This is, this is about humanity. This is about our future. So talk to me about what that passion is for you. You know, there's a line in the movie where our lead uh, character, Jesse Dean, is talking to his wife, Julia. And he says to her, he says, it was a heated discussion. He says, Julia, God has saved us for this world, not from this world. And that really... Say that again. God has saved us for this world, not from this world. That's powerful. Yeah, and that's what motivates me. That line is my life. We have got to, as Christians, out of, out of a love for Jesus Christ, do all that we can today to bring glory to God. How do we bring glory to God? Ask ourselves this question. What is conceived in the womb? If every person would ask that question, what is conceived in the womb? They would realize that it's God who forms us in our mother's womb. And if God has formed us, then we must stand up for life for this world. We've got to help these women who are making these wrong choices and they're being devastated for the rest of their life. These men that are, are complicit in this, now walking away from their own babies uh, and these poor little innocent, vulnerable babies that God tells us to stand up for. And we, that's the passion. We have about three minutes left. When you and I met back in January, we were at an event. There was hundreds of thousands of people that marched in Washington, D.C. for life. And it was beautiful because you couldn't tell whether it was Protestant or Catholic. You couldn't tell what denomination. It, was not, it wasn't about the things that normally divide us. It was this issue of life that united hundreds of thousands of people to come. And, and, and Pastor Sam Rodriguez, who's my, my mentor, my apostle, prophet, pastor, te teacher, and evangelist, uh, and my dietician, though I'm not listening, uh, <laughs> He said, and, and it's, it's the word, it just, it just echoes in my, in my mind all the time. He said, today's complacency is tomorrow's captivity. Yes. We can't let this stand for another generation. We can't wait for our children to take this up. This, this, this must be stopped in our, in our generation. Do you know, at that conference where we met and where I was so impressed with Sammy's speech, I mean, it was just wonderful. He said... And this is what attracted me to him. He said that this issue of life is the number one issue for the Latino community. And our movie, our lead actress is Latino, and she's a hero. People are going to go and see that movie, and they're going to relate to Julie in such a positive way. She's a hero, but she suffered difficult times in her life, and people are going to be able to relate to that. And then we have uh, Paul Rodriguez, who plays the comedic release in, uh, relief in the movie, and he also is Latino and did a wonderful job. So I just was attracted to, to Sammy and, and what he stood for, and I thought the movie and, and uh, the, the Latino community came together in a beautiful way. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say something, then you'll close this out. You'll have about a minute. Say whatever you, what's on your heart. But I don't know if you've noticed, if you even realize this, but we are in the middle of Hispanic Heritage Month. And the movie is opening in the middle of Hispanic Heritage Month wow. with a lead Latina actress with Paul Rodriguez in the movie. So forgive me for bringing it up right now, but La Raza, I mean, let's support the movie. It's, it's, it's our people. It's nuestra gente. I mean, we're there. We're in the movie. <laughs> we're finally there, and it's not Dora. So my God, please get to the theaters and support Voiceless. Stuart, you are an amazing amazing man. I thank God for you. And I want to ask you in the last 30 seconds, 45 seconds, 
Whatever God has in your heart, if you'd look in that camera and just speak a word to those watching. You know, look, Voiceless is a gritty movie. It's real. It's life. Uh, it's flawed characters making decisions that aren't always the best. But it's about a man who puts a stake in the ground and says, I'm not going to take it anymore. I'm going to stand up what's, what, for what's right before God, no matter what. So I urge you, go to voicelessthemovie.com, click on theaters, find out where this is playing near you. It's all over the country. Go and support this movie. And you, by doing that and buying a ticket, are supporting life and letting Hollywood and letting the pro-choice community know that we're not going to take it anymore. We're going to stand up for life. Now, Eddie's coming to sing right now, but I, I just, as you were talking, I sensed in my spirit that there's someone watching the program that maybe you had an abortion in the past. Maybe this is something that's affected your family. And right now, in the name of Jesus, I lift the spirit of condemnation off of your family and off of the generations that are to come. I break that curse in Jesus' name, and I declare life come back to you now in Jesus' name. There's a mother watching. There's a mother watching, and you have children, but there's guilt of, because of an abortion in the past, and you're alive, but you feel lifeless. And the Lord told me to speak a word over you right now. I speak life into you now in Jesus' name. I command the condemnation to come off of you, and I command the joy of your salvation to just blossom all over again, to just bubble up inside of you again. You're set free in Jesus' name. And not only that, but no more tossing. I, I feel it strong on me tonight, but no more tossing and turning in the bed at night, dreaming and just the nightmare, just reliving what took place. You're set free right now. You're going to call TBN and say, I was set free when I saw that program and God has brought shalom and peace into my spirit. So I bless you now and I speak life over you in the name that is above every name, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> The anointing of the Holy Spirit is in this place in a mighty way. Eddie Martinez is coming back. Praise God with him. And we're, man, my, I can hardly talk. God's all over this program. As I pour out my heart, 
Back somewhere in 1994, 95-ish, somewhere in the mid-90s, in the days of oversized clothing and crew cuts and all kinds of stuff, I met Miss Jessica Marquez, who had a different last name right then that I can't remember any longer, but Jessica was a good Texas girl, loved the Lord, and then God has used her life to go around the world preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and uh, she's, she's a family friend, but I'll, I'm going to read the Bible. The, the, I'm going to read the Bible, too, in Jesus' name. But I'm going to read her, bi her bio. She's the lead pastor of Nueva Vida Miami downtown, located in Miami, Florida. God took a Tejana to Miami. And, uh, director and founder of Women Ministering to Women, an international ladies' conference that has held conferences in the country of Mexico, Argentina, Colombia, Mi Patria, Bolivia, Ireland, Nicaragua and Ecuador, one of those doesn't seem like it fits in the list, but anyhow, and, and with attendances exceeding over 5,000 in Nicaragua and Argentina, and um, her, her and her husband have been missionaries for so many years. I want you to welcome Jessica Marquez to TV and God bless you. Thank you. And I believe, I believe in the principle of honor. I believe everybody needs affirmation. When we get to heaven, the first thing that's going to happen when we get to heaven, before anything else, is Jesus looks to us and he says, well done, my faithful servant. The first thing that's going to happen is that the Father affirms us when we get to heaven. And it's so everybody needs affirmation and, to, and needs to be honored. Everybody does. And so I honor you tonight. I'm going to honor you. Thank you, Brother Because Schwartz. not only are you a great preacher and an and a, a amazing wife to your husband and a mother to your children, but you've been an amazing friend. My wife has gone through a very serious bout with cancer, and the doctor and several months ago said she only had two weeks to live, and we had to bring her to Houston to go through all of these uh, procedures, and, and one, of the, one of the requirements of this was that we had to have a 24-hour caretaker, and you're traveling the world, and you're preaching, you're doing this, you're going, doing that, and I was, we were, we were at a point where we had no one. And we had about a 10-day span. We needed someone. And you left Miami in the middle of a church plant, in the middle of planting a church in downtown Miami where you're the lead pastor, doing some seminary, something you were doing out in the Midwest and traveling. You dropped everything to come take care of my wife for 10 days just because she needed somebody. And I honor you today because who does that? And I honor you that God would use you around the world, that you'd be a good enough friend that you'd come and be with my wife. And I thank you. Thank you, Tim. I appreciate that. How does a Tejana, a Texas girl, for those that have forgotten Spanish, wink, wink, how does a Texas girl go all over the world and then end up pastoring in Miami and still be traveling the world? How does that happen? Well, you know, if somebody would ask me way back in the day, first of all, if I would ever see Tony Suarez leading a show on TVN, I would never have believed that. Well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but isn't it something how the Lord works? He yeah. takes us and he not only takes us around the world like he's done with you, but he takes what he has placed in us from long ago. Mm -hmm. And in some way, he allows it just to begin to kind of unfold like a flower. I would never have believed that the Lord would do what he has done in my life. And, you know, that you've mentioned Jessica tonight. She's my friend. That's all that you have to say. When you have a friend, you drop everything and you go and you be with that friend. 
Mm. When you called me, I told you. I've been waiting for the phone call. A lot of times we don't understand that. We have so many friends that all we have to do is pick up a phone and call. Mm. Do you think that's because a lot of us don't really think we have real friends? I think in the culture that we live in, we always expect that when we do something for someone, it's because they're expecting something in return. Mm. That's how we live now. Yeah. But that's not the way that Jesus has instructed for us to be. Mm. He has told us to love our neighbor as our friend. So how much more would we love our friend and just drop everything and go be with them in one of the most trying times of their lives? Uh, I would hope that one day, and it has happened to me many times, where people have just dropped everything and gone to be with me. I appreciate those times because it is during those times that you find out who your real friends are. Yeah. And then you find out who really isn't your friend during that time. Well, praise the Lord. Moving right along from that before I start thinking about some stuff supposed to be under the blood that I think I put under communion in January just so it doesn't start stirring up right now. My God, maybe I needed two drinks of the grape juice. Amen. I've had a week. You'll hear about it in a little while. Uh, Jessica, God, God has used you. You and Antonio have been missionaries to Mexico. And, and stop me because I might miss a country. Mexico. Costa Rica, the Dominican Republic, and then after all of this revival, God brings you back to the United States to pastor a church in Miami. Talk to me about that journey. And, and also, you, you raised a family in the middle of this journey. Talk to me about that. You know, I met my husband when I was 17 years old. He was 16. My. He was a missionary kid and had lived in Mexico most of his life. My father was a pastor at the time, so... We dedicated our life to God. When I met my husband, the very first thing that he told me was, I'm called to be a missionary. So if we proceed with this relationship, know that you're going to move to Mexico with me when we get married. Ten days after we were married, we were living in Mexico. And we were pastoring three churches. And I was 19 and my husband was 18 years did, old. And I'm, I'm asking, a, a, did you already speak Spanish at that I point? I did not speak Spanish. So you're like, Jorale, we're going. I mean, like, just. <laughs> you, you know, the funny thing is that Texans think that they speak Spanish. Yeah. It's until you go to a different country that you realize you really don't know Spanish yeah. at all. <laughs> and so you end up in Mexico 10 days after marriage. So the honeymoon is a missions trip to Mexico. Yes. Brother Antonio, you are more <laughs> spiritual than I am. My God. <laughs> Hallelujah. I went, I went to Fiji on my honeymoon. He said, honey, let's go have Holy Ghost revival oh, in my That in is Mexico. exactly what he did. Amazing. And then you go to these other countries. You raise, and you raise amazing children. Your, da your daughter is a singer. Your, your son, I don't know what, what he's going to invent, like what technology, but that right there is your retirement package. That boy's going to make you some money. <laughs> Praise God for smart kids. I'm like, Lord, touch one of, one of the, th I, got thir I got three. So I'm like, Lord, just whichever one you want to use to, to bless me, Jesus, just put it in one of those three children. Um, but now, not only you, you've been a missionary, you're, you're a lead pastor, but you've broken stereotypes. You are, you're Hispanic, obviously. You are a credentialed minister. You're a preacher. Not only do you speak, but you put on crusades. Now, let's just, let's just be straight. That's not always been, you know, that's not always been kosher, since Stuart's here, that's not always been kosher <laughs> amongst Latinos. You had to have had some opposition. Well, you know, I remember the first time I was invited to go and speak at a conference. It was in Cuernavaca, Morelos, Mexico. Did you just speak in tongues? Well, almost. Whew. Almost. Felt it. But when I was invited, I always say that my friend invited me because she wanted to hang out with me, not because I could preach, <laughs> because you know, I didn't preach back then. Uh, I got there, and there was about 1,000 people in the crowd, and I had never spoken in front of... So your first time preaching, first you get 1,000. My first time. Well? And not only that, my husband and my friend's husband sat in the middle of the crowd, so that just made it a little bit more nerve-wracking mm. for me. After I finished um, speaking, my husband told me, I need to talk to you when we get to the hotel. So I really thought I had done something wrong. I told him, just go ahead and tell me. I, I want to know what, what I did wrong. That way I won't do it again. He said, Jessica, we've been so wrong in your calling. God didn't call you to be a singer. He didn't call you to play whatever instrument you have in your hands. He's called you to be a preacher. Uh, I laughed at him, Tony, and I said, you are so wrong. Because you didn't grow up with this dream. I'm oh, going to no. be a female preacher. 
No, I knew that I had a call of God on my life. I knew that I wanted to do something for him. But it just wasn't the norm back when we were growing up for women to no. be preachers. Yeah. So when he told me that, I laughed at him and I told him, you are wrong. I'm a lady. Ladies don't preach. And then he told me, well, Jessica, you either learn the easy way or the hard way. You'll have to go through a process. Uh, since I'm a little hard-headed, I chose the hard way, mm. and I went through a long process. Uh, those people who know me know that probably in the last 10 years, I had an aneurysm in my brain, had seven strokes, I've been in the hospital 10 times, been paralyzed on both sides of my body. Through every single situation where I found myself in a hospital, it was that first time when I was in the hospital for two months that I was arguing with God and I was telling him, I don't understand what you're doing with me. I don't get it. I don't know why you've allowed this to happen to me. I had an aneurysm in Mexico and was flown back here to Dallas to Baylor Medical Center. When I got here, they didn't know I was allergic to the contrast. It made my heart stop for six minutes. God just really brought us through this long process through my health. But it was when I was in that hospital room where I understood that God was calling me to go uh, way further than I had ever imagined. And when I was laying in that hospital bed one night and I was crying out to the Lord, it was there that I said, God, whatever you ask of me, that's what I'll do. Mm. Wherever you want me to go, that's where I'll go. And that's when my life really just started to become what it is now. Praise God. How many, uh, how many strokes? I've had seven strokes. Three of them were massive. And, and God uses you to pray for the sick. Yes, he does. And God heals all around the world. And we, you know, nobody wants to go through aneurysms and strokes and, and, and health trials. But is it not true that because of what you went through, you believe the anointing is stronger on you to pray for the sick? Not only the anointing is strong, Tony, but I believe that once you have overcome a sickness in your body, that sickness can no longer have authority over you. You have authority over mm. that sickness. Praise God. So even this year in the month of April, I was in the hospital for 11 days. You know that. I remember. The doctors wanted to do biopsies on my lungs. Doctor came in and told me I'd never preach again in my life. He told me because of all the clusters of cells that were in my lungs that the only thing that could be wrong was that my lungs were full of cancer. I turned around and I told him I rebuke that. My family doesn't have cancer. I don't accept it. Cancer is not mine. Mm -hmm. The Lord just turned around the situation and where the doctor had said cancer, he had to come back and say, I don't need to do a biopsy anymore. I don't need to do anything to you. The only thing that you have is influenza A. Now that is a big difference for the doctor to say cancer my than God. say influenza yeah. A. Yeah. But now I feel that whenever I walk into a place and I begin to speak a word, I know that cancer no longer has authority whenever I walk into a door because mm -hmm. I already beat cancer. I know that strokes, I might have one, I might have another, but I already know that God can heal me and I can right. stand right back up. Amen. And I can speak the word and say that somebody will be healed. I've seen every kind of sickness be healed, not only here in the United States, but all over the world. Not because I have any superpowers, because we don't have superpowers. Right. But because when we go through situations in life, the Lord allows us to be able to have a power that we didn't have before. Yes. It's not just anointing, because anointing comes whenever we are preaching the word of God, whenever we're speaking a word of faith. But there's something about authority and power when you walk into a building. Mm. When you walk into a church service and the enemy is there and he's attacking certain people, when you have this authority and this power that has not come just through maybe something that you have heard or read about in a book, but because you have experienced it in your life, it just changes the situation. Mm -hmm. So when you walk in, it just has to bow down before God because he has given you the power. And, and you know, there, there's some young, younger ministers that maybe are watching and, and that are hungering for, uh, for ministries of healing and faith. And I would, I would almost tell them, be careful what you pray for. Growing up, I only, I broke, I think I broke a finger twice, maybe other than that. I've, been, I've never had surgery. I've never really had any health issues. But when I was 17 years old, I was impacted by a healing ministry. And I sought it. I hungered for it. I, I, I sought it. And I begged God. I, it's what I, I just felt a connection. 
And, and God began to use us in, in healing ministry. But I married Jessica, and the doctors gave us less than a 4% chance to have children. Now we have three. One of my, my, my daughter, my second child, was born eight weeks early. We thought she was going to die, collapsed lungs, and the Lord healed her. And now my wife currently going through this bout with cancer. I'm telling you, and I, and I say it unashamedly because I'm making my boast in the Lord, but this ministry has cost us a lot. This ministry yes. has not been cheap, and this is not, it has cost tears, and it has caused sorrow, and there have been nights, and there are even days when we don't understand, but we trust God. But, and, and that's why, the, you know, the, that, that's why, Anybody that has a testimony gets offended with people, and, and I know we're not supposed to, but we get offended when people, you know, want to have, you know, big victories without having any battles because these victories, these testimonies that we have, they cost us a lot. I mean, this costs time on our knees and prayer and fasting and believing on the Lord. None of this came easy. And so be careful what you pray for because for you to have the authority to preach it and to speak it, you're going to have to live through it. And you have lived through it upon several continents and in different churches and in different settings. But look how the Lord is using you now and not only using you, but you're gathering ladies by the thousands. And this is something that impresses me about you. Not only are you Jessica Marquez who preaches, but you feel compelled to, uh, to duplicate what God has put inside of you into other women. So you start this conference called women ministering to women where women are coming by the thousands to Miami, to Argentina, to Ecuador, to Ireland, hungry to be used of God. And you're teaching women, teaching ladies all around the world that the same God that has anointed the Wigglesworths and has anointed the other names that we would know also anoints mighty women of God, the Catherine Cummins and the Jessica Marcuses and others of the, and he's still doing it today. God is raising up a army of of females, of ladies that are, are, that are anointed to preach, to prophesy, to lay hands, and to see the work of the Holy Spirit. That's true, Tony. You know, the thing that comes to mind most, and I always use this illustration about the United States in World War II. You know, we didn't really want to get into the war Ugh. until they came and they attacked us. Right. And there's a famous quote that says that the sleeping giant was awakened. Right. For so many years, women have just been content to do what has been asked of us in our local churches. We are so happy to go in and just do the superficial and not really dig deep mm. and go to war what, for what belongs to us. But then the devil came attacking our family. Yeah. Came trying to steal our children came attacking our marriages, came trying to take away what God had already given to us. And where women's ministry used to be asleep, the devil came in and woke up a sleeping giant. Wow. And we're coming to life. Praise God. You can see this. Hmm. It doesn't matter what organization it is. It doesn't matter what denomination. Women are standing up and they are fighting. They are yelling out and they are crying out battle cries because the devil can't have what belongs to us. No. So my thing is, why would I just want, it's not about me. I'm not looking for glory for myself. I'm looking for us to be able to extend the kingdom of God and I can't do it by myself. So the Lord has allowed me the opportunity to be able to see different women in different countries across the United States that somehow, you know, they've just been overlooked because they don't fit the status quo, mm -hmm. because they don't come with the right pedigree, the right mm -hmm. background, they don't have the right diplomas, but they have something that maybe that person doesn't have. Yeah. And that is the ability to get down on their knees and touch the throne of God and be able to change their world. We have, if you live in Miami, you need to get, what's the name of the church? Nueva Vida Miami. You need to get to Nueva Vida Miami, and, and there's two locations, two campuses that you can visit. You need to hear Jessica. Jessica, we have about two minutes left. Whatever word God has deposited into your heart, I want you to look in the camera, speak to the millions of people that are watching tonight, TBN, all around the world, and speak the word that God has given you to them. I believe that the Lord allows everything to happen, not through coincidence, not by circumstance, but because he has already divined a moment in time where we can all gather together so that there can be a shifting in the atmosphere so that we can be able to go to the next level that he's calling us to. In Miami and across the world, like 
Tony has said, we have women ministering to women, which we'll have October 6th, 7th, and 8th in Miami at the Lauder Hill Performing Arts Center. We've taken leaps of faith and we've asked women to come and join us because where you've been looking for something that maybe you feel like you haven't found until this moment, maybe depression has hit you, maybe you have felt like you just can't go on any longer, there's hope for you. God loves you and he wants to use you because he is no respecter of people, no respecter of persons. Doesn't matter your gender, doesn't matter where you come from. Just heed the voice of God today and listen to him as he calls out your name. And when he calls out your name, would you say, here I am, I, God, use me. And if we do that, isn't it great that the Lord sees us where we're at? Yes. And he says, if you want to be used, I will use you in whatever you are willing to be used. And whatever you're willing to sacrifice for me, I'll take that sacrifice. And it might be hard for a moment, Tony, but whenever the Lord turns the situation around, you'll be able to glorify God for what he did in your life. Hallelujah. And that's the same for everybody who's listening to us today. If you just give God your circumstance, you never know what he is preparing the stage for so that he can be glorified in your life. Pray for the person that's watching that's struggling with insecurity and needs to be set free tonight so that they can fulfill the ministry that God has for them. Right now, in the name of Jesus, Hallelujah. whatever insecurity has had you bound, not allowing you to be the woman of God, the man of God, the person that God has called you to be. We rebuke it right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We ask you, Lord, that you give us that holy boldness like you gave the apostles and the disciples in the book of Acts so that we might be able to turn our world upside down for you. We're believing and we're trusting in you, God, that right now a mighty army might be able to arise so that we can reach out to the four corners of this world and be able to preach your name and be able to do something extraordinary for your kingdom. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' Amen. name. Amen. Amen. Eddie is coming back to lead us in worship. Let's praise God one more time with Eddie Martinez.
Praise God, praise God, praise God. Before I go forward with the program tonight, it would be wrong of me to not take a moment to thank God for the visionaries at TBN and to thank God for Paul and Jan, who over 40 years ago obeyed the voice of God. The vision that God had given, God had given Paul a vision of, of a satellite and that God was going to use this thing. It was like he saw stars that in this dream that would, and that somehow God was going to use these stars to touch the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he obeyed it. Not a man of much wealth, but he obeyed what God showed him. And because of Paul Crouch, I believe, this is my, I, I say it a lot, but I believe it. I believe that the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is sooner than what it would have been. Because the Bible says, you know, the signs of the end time, they're not blood moons and blue moons and cows. It's when the gospel is, pre, pre, I don't know what's wrong with me tonight. When the gospel is preached to the ends of the earth, when it goes to every nation, then the end will come. The only thing standing before Jesus Christ and coming back to this earth is every nation hearing that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the light. And God used TBN and continues to use TBN. And now God is using Matt and Lori Crouch. And I thank them for the opportunity. I thank Pastor Sam Rodriguez, who saw something in me when I was a nobody and had nothing left. But Pastor Sam said, son, I believe in you and I'm going to use. I mean, I, I, I would not be here today if it wasn't for Pastor Sam. And I give him honor. I thank Matt and Lori Crouch. And I thank you for supporting TBN South. So with me tonight is, and I don't say this a lot and about a lot of people, but without any exaggeration, one of the greatest preachers I have ever heard in my life. Like, so... So, so, no pressure. No, 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 pressure. no, no, no pressure no before pressure. you preach to 40 million people. Yeah. But uh, some kids collect baseball cards, you know? Yeah. I used to collect preaching tapes. And so I had, and I, don't, I won't say all the names, but I had, I had my Morton Bustards and I had my T.D. Jakes's and then I had my Jonathan Subers. Oh. I'll holler if I have to, hallelujah. Oh. I, I had them all and I got you on repeat on YouTube. And, and God, I, God has used you in a way to impact my life wow. before you ever... Yeah, I mean, before you knew who I was, I was you made me feel so old. Man, man. I was <laughs> like that stalker at the conferences. I was that guy in the front row. Hi, brother Suver. That was me. The one. No, that security was like, yeah. no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Security, that never happened. Security, yeah. yeah, but you, God has used you in such a mighty way, and I am so honored that you would be here tonight. Thanks. You are, you are a prophet of God. God has used you to impact tens of thousands of people, if not hundreds of thousands of people, all around the world. And now God has brought you to Texas, to Amen. Austin, Amen. to plant a church. Amen. Amen. And, and I, if, if I wasn't already a little comfortable in Virginia Beach, I'd just make my way out come here on, to come Austin. On, come on, come Maybe we'll come. But talk to me about the church. And, and Brother, Brother Super's going to preach tonight, and I'm about to oh take my. a seat. I'm going to get my, my, my Hank. I'm Pentecost. I got my Hank. I got it all ready. But, uh -huh. but so he's going to bring the word. But before you do that, I want to hear about the church. When does it? It's launching here pretty soon. It's launching in like three weeks. Oh, my goodness. 16th of October. And then the next week, 23rd, is just a huge blowout that we're inviting everybody to come into. But what we're doing, is it's kind of crazy. Just think of me, okay. old time Pentecost, yeah. trying to be modern. So yeah. this is what we're saying. We're a 21st century expression of a first century experience. Oh, my goodness. Amen. Well, you know what Matt, Matt Crouch says? Matt Crouch says we need to become spirit contemporary. Oh, that's incredible. This is this new thing. We, we're not going to... See, people think that just because we get a little modern that we've lost Pentecost. No. And that's not it at all. Exactly. We want Pentecost. We exactly. want Pentecost without legalism. Yeah. We want it without bondage, but we don't want to lose Pentecost. Exactly. We, we would be nothing without the moving of the Spirit. But we can still be safe and sane 
Yeah. <laughs> we can be safe and sane yeah. and still be supernatural. And holy. Amen. Unto the Lord. Amen. And what's the name of your church? Oasis Church. Oasis Church. Oasis right? Church from John 4. Okay. Come, those who are thirsty, those who are broken, the outcast, the reject. We're just praying that living water is going to affect everybody. I want to encourage you if you live in the Austin area, and if you don't live in the Austin area, go ahead and just move to Austin. Uh, Unless you go to ready, Rivers of Praise Church that's here tonight from uh, Hillsboro. So... You Unless go. you're from Hillsboro and Rivers of Praise, if you're anywhere else, or Virginia Beach, go ahead and move to Austin and support Oasis Church. This is, Amen. I'm telling you, I'm prophesying right now in Jesus' name that you're going to hear a lot about this church in the years to come, and you're going to see hundreds and maybe even thousands just start coming quickly to this ministry because God has anointed it for such a time as this. Brother Super, I am honored that you'd be Thank here tonight, so and I just uh, just do, do you. I mean, be who oh, you are and let God use you. Would you give Thank God you praise? So Brother Amen. Super's bringing the word. Amen. Amen. Praise God. What a joy. Thank you, Pastor Tony. What a joy. And I couldn't help tonight when Sister Jessica was talking. I just have to tell somebody, you have to understand that if God has delivered you from it, he's given you dominion over it. And there are some of you that are in the middle of God creating a miracle ministry in your life, and you don't understand what's going on because you're living in the in-between. You're living in between miracles. And I just have a word for you. The greater the attack, the greater the anointing. Hallelujah. Number two, hallelujah to God. I'm already feeling at home. Number two, pain is always the process of prophetic release. Yeah. So if you're going through something that's hurting you, that's wounding you, and maybe you've even said, I've never been through this kind of attack, I'm going to tell you the size of your giant determines the size of your destiny. Hallelujah. And for every prophetic anointing, there's going to be a giant like Goliath, but you have to look at the anointing and the prophetic promise that was on David. When David came out, the enemy could not stop him with some little puny soldier a lion couldn't stop him. A bear couldn't stop him. So Goliath had to come. And David just said, you're blocking my door. You got to get out of the way. Hey! You come to me with a sword and a spear. I've come to tell somebody tonight, cancer is just blocking your door. That bankruptcy is just blocking your door. That financial problem you're living in right now, whether it's something in your home, a circumstance with your children, your marriage, or maybe even your ministry, that you're like, I've never been in this position. Here's what the Lord's been speaking to me the last few weeks. He said, you need to watch out for an attack of distraction. He said, tell my people that you're on the brink of a breakthrough. Hallelujah. And right before the breakthrough, you'll always feel like you're about to break down. He said, tell my people to not be distracted because this attack that's coming corporately, internationally, economically, even politically, he said, you better push through because I'm telling you that every delayed promise over your life is about to come to pass. There are people watching Hallelujah. tonight that you know God has given you a miracle, but you haven't seen the manifestation of that miracle. You know that you've been delivered from addiction and things in your past, and it looks like your past has come back to haunt you. I'm telling you right now that right before the breakthrough you're going to always feel like you're at the point of a breakdown and you are to throw your hands up right now and say Holy Spirit take me through the door. Remove every obstacle. Remove every barrier. Take me through the door. The greater the attack, the greater the anointing. One thing I'm learning talking to Pastor Tony, talking to other pastors that I'm just the last few weeks something I'm learning the hard way. Miracles are always messy. Yeah. And we have people that always, you know, for years, I, I was just thinking, telling my son the other night, I was only uh, 14 years old when I saw my first blind eyes open. I was 17 years old when I was in the morgue and saw the dead raised. And we've seen cancer and deliverance and things happen all over the world. But the things that I've learned the hard way is that miracles are messy. And some of you don't understand, if you're saying right now, preacher, you don't understand, I'm in the middle of the messiest situation of my life. This is a word for you. You're in the middle of a miracle and not just a mess. It's not over. You're Hallelujah. just living in the in-between. And as I was praying for this word today, I said, Lord, what do you want me to say? He said, I want you to tell somebody that they are living in the middle of their miracle. They are living in the in-between. They've left where they were, but they haven't yet arrived to where they were going. They have confessed the word of faith, but they haven't had the manifestation of faith that is coming upon their life. I'm preaching to somebody that you're in the middle of something right now. You have felt the anointing. You have felt the touch, but you're in the middle of a mess. Miracles are messy. 
I was reading in the scripture, just going to the New Testament, one thing that I found in the very first miracle that Jesus did, Mark chapter 2. There's three miracles I love in the book of Mark, but the first miracle, we talk about these guys that, um, that begin, I think it's Mark, he takes them, he's coming into the house, he's standing in the house, he's teaching, he's working, he's ministering, he's prophesying, whatever it was that Jesus did when he went into the house. And there's these four guys that come that climb on top of the roof. They climb up on top of the roof and they tear a hole in the roof and they lower this cripple. And we all shout about the cripple man getting up and being healed when Jesus tells him to take up his bed and tells him to get up and walk. And we're like, oh, especially those of us that come from my background. We're like, oh, glory, he was healed. I want to know on Monday morning, who patched the hole in the roof? <laughs> because miracles are messy. So we shout about the miracle, but I want to talk about the hole in the roof. There's people in this room right now, you know that God's able, but there's circumstances going on in the natural. You need somebody to help you patch the roof. Pastor Tony just talked about he needed Jessica to come spend some time with him and spend 10 days to help to make it through what they were going through. Sometimes we need to have the faith for the supernatural and then the ability to get on top of the roof and to patch it out because miracles are messy. One of my favorite miracles. Oh, Lord, I feel like preaching tonight. One of my favorite, one of my favorite miracles in, in Mark chapter 6, Jesus is in a, in a desert place. He's in the wilderness. And you can study it. I guess theologians and I read commentaries and they say it's about seven miles out of the city. So they're in the Judean desert. They're hungry. They're surrounded by multitudes. And all of a sudden it dawns on Jesus. It's lunchtime and we can't call Domino's because Domino's doesn't exist yet. But since he exists in all time, he knows what Domino's tastes like because he's omniscient. He knows everything. But yet we can't order Domino's. So instead, he says, listen, does anybody have a happy meal? And there's this little boy that has five loaves and two fish. He's got five biscuits and two fish sticks. And you know the story. Actually, it was sardines. I don't know if you know anything about sardines, but sardines are stinky. And they had sardines, and he fed 3,000 people with sardines in the desert. We shout about that. It's wonderful. Look what God did. But let's just take a break for a minute and think about what happens next. He takes 12 baskets of fragments. How many disciples were there? There were 12 disciples following Jesus. So for every disciple, he gives them a trash can of sardines to walk seven miles into the city to remind them that at the greatest point of attack in your life, you need to realize that miracles are messy. And I want you to smell what these sardines smell like to let you know that I could take two sardines and feed 3,000 people. And if I can do that, I can get you out of your circumstance. If I can do that, I can make a way where there seemeth to be no way. I can pay your light bill, baby. I can touch your children. I can help your marriage. I can mend your broken heart because miracles are messy. <laughs> I, I, I was praying and I said, Lord, what is the word? What are you wanting me to talk about? I understand that I, I, I want to preach faith. I want to preach miracles. He said, I want you to talk about the reality of living in the messy part of the miracle, living in the in-between, living in between the touches. I think one of the greatest scenarios in scripture in, in my life, my ministry, I love to preach miracles, but in Mark chapter 8, we find the scenario of the blind man. It's the only miracle that we have in the ministry of Jesus where Jesus touches someone, speaks to someone, and they're not healed the first time they are touched or the first time they're spoken to. I'm preaching to somebody tonight that you're in that position that God has touched you. You have received a word from the Lord. There has been a prophetic word. You've had a dream. You've had a vision. There are things that God has confirmed in your, wor in your life and in your world, but yet you have not yet received the manifestation. In the Who am I talking to that's living in the in-between? You have stepped out on faith. You have great faith. You know that God is able. You know that God can, but right now you're asking, can, not only can God, but will God? I know God is able, but is it his will to do it now? I know what he did in the Bible, but here's my question for you. Is Jesus Christ the great I was, or is he still the great I am? Is he... <laughs> Is he the great, was that that organ just went off? Is he the great I am or is he the I was? And here's where you need to understand. I believe that Jesus is the alpha and the omega. Yeah. 
We all have an alpha anointing. That's when you got saved and that's when faith come into your heart. But there are some of us that want to leave our alpha and step into our omega. We know that God started it, but we're waiting for God to finish it because not only is he the author, he is the finisher of our faith. And if I was a real preacher tonight, I would look at somebody and say, I'm stepping out of the middle and I'm stepping into my omega zone. I am stepping out of my past. I'm stepping out of my fear. I'm stepping out of the diagnosis. I'm stepping out of what the banker said, the lawyer said, the pastor said, my mother-in-law said, and I'm stepping into my next and my future and my anointing in the Holy Ghost. Ah, I want that, that, that omega. I'm just feeling that power, feeling that anointing that I'm getting ready to step into my next. In this scenario, Jesus is standing there. He comes with a need. We know from history and from the Bible that Jesus has healed. He has raised the dead. He has walked on water. He has multiplied loaves and fishes. He has cast out multitudes of demons. And now here comes this blind man and is asking him for a miracle. Here's what the Bible says in verse 22. And when he had spit on his eyes, he put his hands on him. Somebody say miracles are messy. When he spit on his eyes, he puts his hands on him and asked if he saw anything. And the man looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. In the middle of your miracle, you are always going to feel that things are fuzzy and out of control and out of focus. In the middle of your miracle, you are always going to feel like what God told you is not really in focus. It's not clear. What do you see? I see men. When he says he sees men, it shows us he was not born blind. He knows what it is to see. So we're not looking at just a miracle. We're looking at a restoration. No, you need to hear me. There's someone listening to me. You know what it is to be blessed. You know what it is to preach under the prophetic anointing. You know what it is to operate in such a financial breakthrough anointing as an entrepreneur. You know what it is to lay hands on others and they are healed. You know what it is to prosper. You know what it is to have a happy home. You know what it is to have children that admire you and respect you. And now everything seems broken. Everything seems fuzzy and foggy. I was preaching a few weeks ago and a woman come up and said, Pastor, things are just froggy. I said, what's froggy? She said, it's fuzzy and foggy. They're just froggy. And there are some of you tonight, you're in a situation that just seems froggy because you are finding that God has touched you. He has spoken to you. Jesus had put spittle on the ground, took that mud, put it in his eye. If something's ever going to happen, it's when Jesus spits on you and put mud on you. If anything's going to happen, Jesus starts spitting the miracles coming. And so he removes the mud and he says, no, that was just messy. It's a little clearer. It's a little better. But I see men, but they're like trees walking. And here's what the Bible said. Then he put his hands on his eyes again. Somebody say again. again. It, someone is living in the middle in between touches. You are in between miracles. You are living in the in between. And you have received this word that right before the break, Breakthrough. I feel like I'm about to break down. So sitting here watching tonight, whether you're in the audience or at home, I'm preaching to somebody that feels like you're living in the no man's land of things being fuzzy. Things aren't clear. Things aren't what I thought they were going to be. Things aren't turning out the way I thought they were going to turn out. What's going to happen? Pastor, what do you think is going to happen for me? I'm going to tell you it's time for the second touch. It's time not only for you to be praying for a miracle, but you need to begin to pray for restoration. I'm praying that I would be restored to what I have already experienced in my life. I don't care what your failure was. I don't care what your mistake was. I don't care what your sin was. Your failures have been equated into your future. I need to talk to somebody that's living in a mess right now. If you're still breathing, God is not finished with you because it is appointed unto man first to die and then the judgment. If you're still breathing, God is not finished with you. 
if God was going to judge you based upon that sin, that failure, that mess, that mistake, if God was going to judge you on that failure, you would have died before you had a chance for grace to be imparted in your life and before you could repent of your sins. But if you have lived past the failure, if you have lived past the mess, the Holy Spirit is pushing you into the restoration of your miracle. Oh, somebody hear me right now. Somebody hear me. If your failure was not fatal, then your failure was not final, and your failures have been equated into your future. For these are they that overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And what you think is a mess, God's about to turn into a message. And what you think was a failure is God setting you up for the second touch. And I feel so strong right now that people that are watching even live, people that have been praying for an answer, don't give up. I know it's messy. I know it stinks. I know it's not clear. I understand that you're saying men look like trees. I have no money. It looks like I'm broke. It looks like I'm rejected. It looks like I'm abandoned. It looks like divorce is imminent. It looks like I'll never preach again. In the midst of saying all of that and admitting it's your reality, I want you to say, Lord, before I accept this for my future, I want you to touch me one more time. And I thank you for everything you've done in the past. And I thank you for keeping me in the middle. But I'm asking you now to propel me into my next. And I'm about to step into my omega zone. I'm getting ready to step into every prophecy every promise, every blessing, every breakthrough anointing that God has ever spoken to my life. And I'm telling you tonight, you're leaving the middle and you're stepping into your next in Jesus' name. Jonathan Suba, that, that word was for me. That word, that God brought you from Austin tonight for me Hallelujah. because this has been a bad week oh. for me and I I, I didn't I, I said I, I can't even minister tonight. I can't do anything but I'm telling you why you were while you were speaking, I was being restored over here on the side. I mean, uh, this, I feel joy, I feel happiness, I feel authority, I feel anointing. You, you, I mean, you know the story, and, and, and those of you that, that, that are on TV and South and you follow and you've been praying for us, my wife was diagnosed with cancer in February. They said she had two weeks to live, and then God did a work, and it was miracle after miracle, and then three weeks ago, the doctors, it's signed, I got the paper, I'm a, I'm a put it in a plaque and hang it in the wall. The doctor said there is no cancer in her body. She's completely healed the cancer. Steve Strang, the founder of Charisma, heard about the miracle. Steve Strang called my wife's doctors and he said, he said, Tony, I want to do an article, but you know sometimes people, you know, blow things out of, out of proportion. Let's just double check. And so he calls the doctor and the doctor tells Steve Strang, there is no cancer in her body. So we've been rejoicing. We've Amen. been celebrating. Jessica was going to be on this program. We were going to talk about her healing. And then just a few days ago, she falls and she injures her arm and now she's back in the hospital and her white blood cell count is just, it's rising. It's, it's risen by like 15,000 points in just 72 hours. And, you know, I'm telling everybody God's a healer and God's healed my wife and this has gone viral, viral. It's gone around the nation, around the world that God healed my wife. And it was like, I'm just being transparent. Yeah. It was like yeah. a punch in the gut. I, I'm, exactly. I, I'm like, God, what just, what just happened? Yeah. But rather than lament what we're going through, because I don't understand what God, I don't understand what he's doing. But I'm here to declare tonight in Jesus' name that what God started, he's going to finish. He's not just the alpha. He is the omega and he's everything in between. I'm taking your word. When, I, when this show ends, I'm going to get in a car and I'm going to drive to Houston with this anointing. I'm going to lay hands on my wife. And I'm going to say, get up in the name of Jesus. And, and there are people watching this program right now that are stuck in the middle. You're in the mess. Everything that Brother Suber said and God told me to speak to you. This is what God told me to tell you. Ever be, even before my wife got injured and before all this happened, God said there's going to be Hannahs that are watching the program tonight. There's going to be some Hannahs that are in the room. Hannahs are, they're, they're, the, they're the wife that has no children. They're the, they're, the, they're the ones that go to Shiloh and they see everybody else blessed and they see everyone else rejoicing and they see everyone else feasting and they have nothing and 
They, they're asking God, when is my season coming? When is my miracle coming? When is my breakthrough coming? And you've watched everyone else rejoice. You've watched everyone else's church grow and you've seen everyone else get healed. You've seen everyone else get a new house and a new car and even two new dogs. And you saw everybody else get married and you've been sitting there saying, when is my turn? And people have mocked you and they've scorned you. And even the ministry has made fun of you because yes. Eli, when he saw Hannah, said something's wrong with you, but God sent me here to tell you that you're next. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, you are next because you didn't lose faith, because you didn't lose hope. And God told me to tell you that at this time next year, you're not going to come to Shiloh alone, but you're going to bring a baby with you. You're going to bring a miracle with you because the God that does everything perfect is about to bless your home, is about to bless your ministry, is about to bless your money. And if I were you, if you're in prison, I'd give them praise. If you're in hospital and you say, I can't get up, I just shake in the hospital bed right now. Wherever you are, I would give God praise because it's been messy. It's, it's not the way I would have, it's not the way I would have written the miracle. But God rebuked me one time and he said, Suarez, you're not the author of your story. I, w I was trying to figure out something that was going yeah. on, tumultuous yeah. time in our life. And I'm like, God, but this, and he said, you're not the author. You're not the author. He said, you make too many definitive statements. He said, I'm the author and the finisher Hallelujah. of your faith. And God said, stop putting periods where I intend for there to be commas. Stop saying it's over when I'm saying it just began. So I'm declaring to someone in Jesus' name, God's baptizing your life with commas right now. He's baptizing your life with mess. But don't worry, this mess is going to bring your miracle. I heard Sam Rodriguez say, Pastor Sam said, Jesus spit in the mud. And you know, it's messy. I wouldn't want you to spit on me. I wouldn't want you to put mud in my eyes. But when Jesus spit in the mud, oh my God, uh, uh, I'm going to lose it right here. I need a catcher. Uh, when Jesus spit <laughs> in the mud, <laughs> when Jesus spit in the mud and he put it on that man's eyes, Jesus was taking his DNA, yeah, his DNA and he was just rubbing it all over that man that needed a miracle. Uh, and I'm declaring that in this mess, there is an anointing that's coming from the Father and it's going to get all over you. And when you come out of this, you're going to say, I have been with Jesus, and there's going to be evidence in your life. Would you give God a praise right now like you believe the Word of God? Woo! Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. There, in the name, Brother Super, pray for the sick. We got 10 seconds. Just speak a word of healing. Father, right I now. pray that the neutral button would be taken off. I release activation. Activation over every delayed prophetic word, every promise of healing, deliverance, and freedom. Now, by the authority of the name of Jesus, we loose and decree miracles, signs, and wonders instantly, supernaturally, now to the glory of the Lord in the Jesus name Christ. Of Jesus, would you give God praise. Eddie, take us out, giving God praise tonight. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Rey de gloria, quien como tú, poderoso, precioso es. Torre fuerte eres tú, cielo es tu Soy 
te cantan Los mares hoy proclaman Tu nombre Jesús Los cielos te alaban Los montes hoy te cantan Los mares hoy proclaman Tu nombre Jesús Los cielos te alaban Los montes hoy te cantan Los mares hoy proclaman Tu nombre Jesús Toda la creación canta De tu majestad y tu bondad Y los corazones te adorarán Y cantarán a ti Señor Well, 